Good morning and welcome to this, the second meeting of the U Equal Opportunities Committee for 2016. Um, as you know, if you wish to use tablet devices, if you could put them on silent, please, as they interfere with broadcasting. Um, uh, first agenda item is a declaration of interest, and that declaration today is from our member, David Torrance. David. Thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the substantive uh, piece of work for our committee this morning is agenda item two, which is a discussion on our work programme. Um, with us this morning, we have Angela Constance, MSP, who is a Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities. And supporting her today is Yvonne Strachan, who is the Head of Equality, Human Rights and the Third Sector Director at the Scottish Government. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can we thank you for your letter to committee, because it allows us to sort of set, set the scene and where we want to go. I know we only have 45 minutes with you today and you've already done quite a detailed session this morning um, and we, we, we're very grateful that you could come along and speak to us today. Um, I'm going to just uh, give you a quite a wide-ranging opening question um, and then go, go to members' questions that way uh, to allow us to get the most out of it. I've sort of uh, explained to the members about concise uh, questions and we would probably appreciate concise answers and we could get the most out of this morning for, for all of us um, in that respect. But we know we have a lot to say in this area and we appreciate that very much. So my sort of opening question is, you know, essentially what, what is your government's priorities? However, I need to caveat that, caveat that with um, how are those priorities now, uh, given the potential uh, withdrawal from the European Union and the subsequent impact that would maybe have with calls for a repeal uh, of the Human Rights Act and uh, a withdrawal from ECHR? Okay, I'm not known for my brevity, but um, I suppose I'm just going to start by saying uh, three things and, you know, members will have, you know, the opportunity to question me about various uh, manifesto commitments uh, made over the piece uh, by the government. First thing I want to say is that equalities in human rights is a function of government, it's a function of this government uh, and all ministers uh, and indeed uh, all our partners across the public sector uh, have that responsibility. Uh, and we have a good top-level manifesto commitment about doing more to embed uh, our ob obligations. And what I want to do, you know, in the weeks and months ahead is to ensure that as we are discussing equalities uh, and human rights, that as much as possible we're doing that in plain English. A lot of this debate and narrative can be quite philosophical, not saying that that's a bad thing. It can be quite legal, not saying that's a bad thing. But given um, events uh, over uh, the past week uh, with the, the, the Brexit vote, uh, we will have to be making uh, a very strong uh, defence of the Human Rights Act, uh, for example. And I believe it's beholden on all of us to explain uh, how human rights uh, is relevant uh, to everyone and in their day-to-day uh, experience uh, of, of, of life. We have to be making this relevant uh, to folks' uh, lives. Now, in terms of uh, Brexit, you, everybody here will have you know, heard the First Minister's statement uh, and will have seen events uh, un unfold uh, over the past week, and I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, any of, of that. But there is that uncertainty. Um, we don't as yet know the consequences or the fallout in terms of how that economic uncertainty will impact on uh, public finances, uh, for um, e example. Uh, and I suppose in terms of um, you know, the immediate future, um, while you know, uh, we're still part of Europe, uh, as, as things uh, stand, so there are no imminent changes other than you know, the uncertainty about the future and the impact that that will have on uh, public sector finances. Okay. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We're going to go to some specific topics and each member has uh, their own uh, issues that they want to raise with you and I'm going to go to Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, Minister, and can I thank you for your a statement which came to us which was very helpful. I, I have two questions which are slightly different, but if I can take the first one, it's on page three of your statement in regard to tackling hate crime. Um, I think we all welcome the progress that has been made on this, uh, but a number of groups have kind of spoken to me from different areas to say, would it be possible 
for the government to look at some kind of review of how people are treated who have had a hate crime against them. We have information about how many cases go to the fiscal, but post that, there's little information in regard to that, and also how people are treated um, when they first approach the police, um, and also in regard to, at the end, where the sheriffs do take a, a, a greater role in sentencing because it is a hate crime. And I think certainly uh, disabled groups and other sectors would like maybe a, some kind of case study of people who have gone through that and their experience and how it's working. Now, clearly, the remit, we need quite a lot of work, but in principle, is that something that the Scottish Government would be willing to look at? I think the importance of case studies uh, and bringing to, to, to life uh, you know, examples uh, of what people have experienced uh, in being the victim of a hate crime, but also crucially in terms of how uh, the authorities, uh, not least the police, have uh, responded to that. And I know Police Scotland have very clear uh, commitments uh, in and around uh, equalities uh, training. I mean, we want uh, police officers and indeed you know others to you know understand what hate crime is uh, what the law says uh, and to be sensitive and appropriate uh, when they're dealing with reports uh, of of that uh, nature um, i think you're right to, to raise the issue of tackling hate crime because it is one of our uh, key priorities um, race uh, hate crime remains the biggest uh, category, although it's fallen a little bit over the year, but it accounts for you know, the majority um, of hate crimes, and we've seen a 20% increase uh, in LGBTI uh, crimes as well. Um, and you know, there's been some variation, although smaller numbers um, in terms of Islamophobia, uh, crimes against disabled people, we've seen an increase in crimes uh, against uh, transgender people as well. And you know, while those increasing figures, it's not, it's not, not good news, but we have to be clear that we do want people to report hate crimes. Uh, so we need to have that nuanced understanding of what, what the statistics uh, are, are absolutely uh, saying to us. But I look forward to working with the committee uh, and members about how we can improve our understanding and indeed our scrutiny uh, of how others are, are, are exercising uh, the, 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 the duties. So we'll, we'll take that away and uh, give, give it some further, further thought, convener. Thank you, Minister. The second area uh, is... Uh, quite different for that. We obviously had a, 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 an interesting debate yesterday afternoon um, a, a, about um, lots of things around um, equality, in particular in regard to the number of people who should be on boards, 50-50. Now, you know, my, my party may take a different view on that um, at the moment, and, and, but if we are going to go down that road, if that's where the Scottish Government is going to go, can I ask, should we not be looking at other areas as well? For example, one in five people are disabled in Scotland? Should they have representation on boards to that percentage? Should people who come from uh, different racial minorities have representation on boards? I just wonder why are we focusing on one area and not on all areas of equality? I think uh, a positive note from the debate yesterday was that uh, I think there was agreement across the political divide that diversity is good and that diversity in those who are uh, in positions of leadership and those who are on boards uh, making decisions about public resources and how uh, public services are delivered, uh, that that's a good thing. And yes, I think there's um, a difference of opinion on how best to achieve that. Um, in terms of gender equality, women, of course, are more than half uh, the population. Uh, and, you know, we've, wait, we've waited a long time. Um, but I take your point that, you know, if we're committed to diversity and equality, actually it has to apply uh, to, to, to everybody. Um, and there is no, there's no silver bullet. I mean, we're not pretending that uh, gender inequality will be solved overnight because we introduce, uh, you know, quotas on uh, public sector boards. Um, you know, we need that comprehensive action that actually starts 
uh, in the early years and uh, goes all the way through to you know women's experience uh, in the labour market and uh, indeed older women's experience uh, of, of the labour market uh, but it is something that I fundamentally uh, believe and it's no secret that I'm uh, a supporter of the the 50-50 the campaign, I think it's an issue whose, whose time has come. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we, we're close to you know, other ideas about how to improve diversity and equality across the field. Okay. Yeah. Mary Fee. Thank you, convener. Good morning, um, Cabinet Secretary. Can I start by asking you about gypsy travellers? And the Cabinet Secretary will know that in session four there was two inquiries into gypsy travellers, and I was the convener of this committee when those inquiries were, were done. And anecdotal evidence um, tells me that there has been little or no progress in relation to the condition of sites that gypsy travellers live on and also the provision of sites for gypsy travellers. Access to care for gypsy travellers has shown very little improvement and indeed the discrimination <clears throat> that gypsy travellers face has not improved at all. And I am aware that our national strategy for gypsy travellers is to be published and I wonder if you could give us an update on the progress of that and what further work you think is necessary in relation to gypsy travellers. I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of further work needed uh, in and around issues that impact uh, on gypsy travellers. Um, as a government, we do you know, recognise that they are a distinct uh, ethnic group and we encourage uh, others uh, to do so. Um, we certainly you know, recognise and pay tribute to the previous work done uh, by the committee uh, in this area. And uh, Mary Fee's right to touch upon that uh, the work on the strategy did pause uh, in 2015 to allow for a period uh, of reflection. And that you know, came as a result of concerns uh, from the Gypsy Traveller uh, Strategy Development Group. And I think sometimes you know, we do need to pause things as opposed to carrying on uh, regardless. Um, I mean, other work you know, continues you know, in relation to education and traveller sites. But I mean, we're happy to be thinking further about how we take that, that work forward. So I don't have a definitive answer about, you know, uh, what we will do uh, when, other than a very honest, you know, recognition that we've got much more work to do. And actually, you know, I would rather work was paused as opposed to us, you know, carry on in, in a careless or a, or a regardless uh, fashion. So one of the things I want to do over the summer is kind of take stock um, of that work, um, you know, so that a future date um, I can come back to committee and, and point to, you know, a direction of travel. But I mean, if there are particular issues or aspects or uh, route maps uh, that members, you know, wish to pursue, I'm sure you won't be shy in coming forward. Okay, thanks. So, will the national strategy be published later in the year? Um, that's a possibility, but I want to really um, immerse myself in some of the issues before giving uh, a, a, final, a final commitment. Um, I want the national strategy to be right. I don't, I don't want to publish something that's then going to be, you know, that we can't take people on board mm. with us. Yeah, because you, I mean, you, you will be aware that the Gypsy Traveller community are very keen to see progress made. Um, and any kind of signal that there are further delays only mm. diminishes the faith that the gypsy travelling community yeah. have that change will actually be made. Yeah, OK. I mean, we'll take, we'll take that on board, that there's a, a frustration mm. and that uh, any more needless delay would, would send out the, the, the strong signal. But maybe it's something I could come back to committee about after, yeah, after summer could, recess. Could. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, of course you can. David. Um, Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It's um, to do with the same gypsy travellers and the lack of sites. How do we encourage local authorities to provide them? Because in many instances that I've dealt with, it's a lack of these sites that are a conflict between the gypsy travellers and the local communities. It causes a problem. And I, th I think that's a good point. And I know that there was uh, changes in the, the legislation that I think actually goes back uh, 10 years um, that... Um, change the obligations on, on local authorities, but I'll maybe ask um, Yvonne to, if she has any detail on that. My memory is a bit scratchy. Yeah. 
Um, the, there are two things. Um, <coughs> first of all, the, um, there are requirements on local authorities and their local housing strategies to take account of gypsy travellers' needs as part of uh, those requirements. Um, and certainly um, that um, has been uh, expected of um, our, our local authorities. The, in 2014, there was revised guidance on the housing need and demand assessments for local housing strategies, I think, to take account of the fact that there have been these concerns, and that was to make sure that the accommodation needs of gypsy travellers are fully taken into account by councils as they plan accommodation provision in their area. Um, and I think, you know, the expectation was that that would help to drive forward a different approach and local authorities. Um, in May 19, uh, 2015, um, the Scottish Government published minimum quality standards for gypsy traveller sites um, and core rights and responsibilities for site tenants. And those were kind of developed with um, uh, gypsy traveller uh, site tenants, local authorities and other stakeholders. So I think, the, you know, uh, the responsibility for sites rests with local government. Um, but the government, Scottish Government recognises uh, what it, you know, it will do what it can in order to encourage that and through its relationship um, around housing um, and accommodation sites, um, relate, uh, then that's the, the process that has been uh, used to date. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, <clears throat> I know there's legislation there, but from my experience, the lack of sites, councils are reluctant to provide them. Yeah. Um, so, could we maybe have an update on how many new sites have been provided by the 32 local authorities and how many are needed? Because I know in the area I represent Fife, we have a huge problem with lack of sites and for gypsy travellers. Come back to I'll us provide on this. that factual information. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only question I've got to add to it is the housing strategies. Uh, Yvonne, you said that there's an expectation. Is it only an expectation or is there a duty? Um, well, there's a duty for, for um, local authorities to consider the needs of uh, ethnic minorities as part of their development of, of, yeah. of strategic approaches. And the guidance expects that, that in that process that gypsy travellers will be part of those considerations. Um, so we can... Yeah, because expectation holds much less weight than a duty. So that's, that's maybe where we need to get that defined. But if you can update the committee, that would be very so, helpful. Yeah. Mary, if you... If you've I wanted to ask yep. a, a further brief question, and it's on um, gender recognition. I wonder if you could update us on when you intend to review gender recognition law, because you will be aware that the Transgender Alliance are calling for a reduction in the age from 18 to 16, and also the removal of psychiatric diagnosis. So where are you with a, a, a view to the well, to What we will do... Things? Sorry, forgive me. We will no. spend... Um, the rest of the year speaking to stakeholders with a view to consultant um, you know in the first half of 2017 um, there is a very clear commitment from the government that we want to review gender recognition mm. law in line uh, with best practice and there is a uh, unanimity on that uh, across uh, the chamber um, and I think all parties have a commitment uh, to that uh, there are indeed some complexities and mm. some issues that we will need to look at uh, in depth in terms of the role of um, doctors and the you know, uh, preponderance of a, a medical model, uh, if you like, and the issues around age you know, will have to be looked at uh, very uh, closely indeed. So we want to have that in-depth discussion and dialogue uh, with a range of stakeholders with a view to having a consultation uh, next year. Um, and just for um, committee's interest, the UK government, uh, David Mundell, um, has intimated to me that this is an area that the UK government uh, are also uh, looking at, and we've sort of um, informally uh, at this stage kind of commenced that dialogue about how any provisions could uh, dovetail, because while you know, this is largely uh, devolved, um, it could feed into areas that are reserved. Uh, so we want to have a kind of pragmatic you know, discussion with the UK government as well, because I think they have, or certainly David Madale has a commitment uh, to make progress in this area too. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you for that update. Thank I you. also think it's very welcome, and, and, and one additional thing for me, or two additional things for me, would be obviously some of the, the challenges to this in the past has been we can't change it because of an impact on pensions. And if you're saying then if David Mundell and the UK government, that, that's an issue that would maybe yeah. it not be such a huge issue. The other issue for me was um, a specific constituency case, actually, someone who needs to, who wants to have their medical records changed to reflect the fact, you know, she's a woman. Um, and, and that would be something 
that, that that consultation would look at too, is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll have to be a way, quite broad, broad range in con yeah. consultation, but okay. that's why I want to take a bit of time talking to stakeholders so that the consultation is, is crafted and uh, covers all the bases. Excellent, thank you. Alec O'Hallman. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, can I start by declaring an interest that I am an outgoing member of the leadership panel of the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights. I'm also a past convener of Together, the Scottish Alliance uh, for Children's Rights. Um, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much for coming to see us and thank you for your paper. I have two specific questions. I'll, I'll take each in turn. Firstly, uh, I think all of us were caused to reflect um, after the atrocity in Orlando as to how in public policy we still discriminate in any vestiges against the um, LGBT, LGBT plus community. Um, and to that end, could you perhaps outline the Scottish Government's consideration of any areas where we still in public policy discriminate against that community and in particular the ban on blood donation? Yeah, I mean, I'll get back to you on the specifics in and around uh, blood uh, donation. Um, you know, it might be something that health ministers, it's more useful for them to correspond uh, with a uh, committee on. But I think, you know, the, the, the broad point that, um, you know, the atrocities at Orlando, you know, the impact that that has had on the LGBTI community here, um, as you alluded to, you know, underlines, uh, you know, the, the, the ongoing need to, you know, really actually embed human rights and international treaties and practice and how we actually make that a reality uh, for, for, for any community, how it really, you know, works for people um, on, 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 on the ground. Um, secondly, in page four of your report, you talk about uh, the successful reports that Scottish Government has already in given in terms of a strong account on our efforts to implement um, our obligations to particularly the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, in two areas, I think we, we still struggle. Firstly, um, the actual practical application of children's rights, particularly at a local authority level. We're seeing the decline in the number of children's rights officers employed in local authorities. Um, and uh, still reporting isn't perhaps as we envisaged it when we passed the part one of the Children and Young People Act. Um, and similarly, without full incorporation, ch children still don't have access to justice in terms of um, the abuses against their rights. And secondly, and as a supplemental to that, um, can you give an idea as to where the Scottish Government is in terms of physical punishment? Because we will forever be out of step with our obligations to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, while we still legitimately allow violence against children in the home. Okay. Um, I mean, Mr. Cole Hamilton will be aware of our, our, our manifesto commitment to um, embed and give further effect to uh, international treaties. He rightly points to the fact that we openly uh, put ourselves forward uh, for scrutiny. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to uh, indeed be scrutinised at uh, UN committees um, and you know, a, a challenge and a debate uh, for this next parliament will be, um, you know, in, in, in the words of the First Minister, how we give, you know, better effect to international treaties uh, in Scotland. Um, you know, issues around incorporation are important. Um, they don't always necessarily lead to better policy um, because this is where we're relying on human beings and politicians and people uh, implementing uh, treaties. But, you know, we recognise uh, that they are uh, indeed important. And in terms of the Children and Young People Act, um, there was um, an ongoing, you know, legislative commitment to, you know, review I suppose in many ways keep, keep open, uh, review the impact of how we were all given, um, you know, further meaning and further realisation to, to the rights of children and our international treaties. So, you know, that debate isn't over. Um, as a government, we and the education ministers will certainly have to be, you know, accounting for that and uh, reporting back. Um, I am aware of the concerns about the decreasing number of children's uh, rights officers. Um, in terms of uh, smacking, I know this was an issue of great interest to Alison McInnes uh, and indeed to uh, many members um, across the chamber. Um, Mr Cole Hammond 
will know that um, uh, the government is not in favour of smacking. Uh, we don't uh, encourage it. We um, have tried to uh, support people to be aware of other uh, ways to um, inform and shape the behaviour of, of, of the children. There is evidence that uh, you know, smacking can be harmful. So, I mean, the government doesn't uh, support uh, smacking in any shape uh, or forum. Where we've had some concerns or reticence um, is about, you know, would we be uh, needlessly, you know, criminalising parents uh, for um, smacking or, 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 or lightly smacking and how that indeed could be uh, detrimental to, to, to family life. But it is, um, as with all matters about how we improve the lives of children uh, and indeed their um, how we protect their rights. I mean, these are all very uh, live issues that I'm sure Mr Cole Hamilton will uh, pick up on the good work and the interest, the genuine interest that Alison McInnes had in this area. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for your reply. Um, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, this is uh, much about this we need to take out of party politics and look towards furthering their interests of children if we are genuinely to uh, achieve that shared ambition of making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. I, I think we could spend all day <coughs> arguing about smacking, but I would reflect uh, on one particular point that we remain one of only four countries left in the Council of Europe still not to extend equal protection to children in the eyes of the law. This has not led to criminalis criminalisation needlessly of parents in, in the many, many European countries who have taken this step already. Um, furthermore, I think that um, the, the Scottish Government are to be applauded on the work they have done on children's rights, but I, I think it hasn't gone far enough. There was a draft piece of legislation in the last parliamentary session which was a standalone act on, or, or, or bill on the rights of children and young people, which was then conflated into the Children and Young People Act to become part one and moved us from a position where we were going to have due regard um, uh, and actual just disability around the UNCRC to a, 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 slight, a very watered down commitment for ministers to raise awareness of the UNCRC. Frankly, I don't think that's ambitious enough, and I think we will be forever um, making excuses to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child until we actually get serious on this. I'm not sure if Mr Coham is uh, looking at me to respond uh, to his uh, statement or not, and I'm conscious uh, that the convener had instructed me uh, for brevity. I mean, I think probably the simplest thing to say without going over the history of the Children and Young People Act and you know, how two specific acts became one act uh, and, and all that. I think if we can point to the positive that, you know, that the act has very specific requirements uh, on government to constantly be reviewing how we put in practice children's rights and the debate in and around many aspects of how we improve the lives of children and how we enhance and protect their rights uh, is not a debate uh, that is over uh, and uh, you know uh, as a government minister I, I, I note uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's uh, indication of ongoing parliamentary interest. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ellie Coffey. Thanks very much. Yeah. Good morning Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wonder if I could just uh, talk roughly about the, the broader legislative landscape that we might find ourselves in after last uh, week's decision. As, you, as you're well aware, equalities and human rights are pretty much embedded in everything that the Scottish Parliament does, and all our legislation complies with uh, European Union laws and frameworks and so on. Post-Brexit, uh, if it happens, do you see us in the Scottish Parliament having to try to unpick much of our legislation uh, at that stage, or do you see that uh, the Scottish Parliament can maintain the legislative framework that we currently mm. have to remain consistent with those principles that are enshrined in European yeah. law? Uh, goodness me, uh, I'm really going to struggle to answer this question uh, with any uh, brevity convener, so, but uh, I'll take my guidance uh, from you. <laughs> um, there's, there's two different things, actually there's three different things at play. I mean, um, you know, that this, this, this government is uh, a strong defender of the Human Rights Act, the current Human Rights Act, um, any suggestion that it